Hi, I'm Don Norris, and welcome to another edition of Brandvertising on FuseLogic TV. Did you know a recent study by Interbrand, a leading global branding firm, noted that few marketers know how to create new customer needs, let alone know how to innovate to meet them? Well, today, we're going to look into the world of product development and innovation to shed some light on the thinking that marketers put into developing new products. I'm going to look at some recent new product success and have a chat with Timothy Lee, the Marketing Director of Innovation from Effects of Life Sciences, the cold effects people. Tim has a background and viewpoint on product innovation that I think many will find interesting. So, as we get set to talk with Tim, I want to share with you a YouTube clip of the top 10 new products from 2010. At the back of that, we'll come back and talk with Tim. Launch TV introduces the 2010 Most Memorable New Product Launch Top 10 Countdown, brought to you by Schneider Associates, Symphony IRI, and Sentient Decision Science. There was no telling which launches would register with consumers as the most memorable new products of the year. So like my MTV DJs before me, let's count it down. Tied at the number 10 spot are the KFC Double Down Sandwich and Kleenex Hand Towels. Launched in April 2010, KFC took the sandwich world by storm with this bunless chicken sandwich. In March 2010, Kleenex launched its single-use hand towel and created a special drying song for children. Coming in at number 9 is the Huggies Jean Diaper. Launched in May 2010, Huggies used fashion shows, celebrity endorsements, social media, and giveaways to introduce moms to the high-styling diapers. This March, Samsung changed TV with the launch of its 3D television, which took the 8th spot in our survey. Enlisting the Black Eyed Peas for the launch event in Times Square, Samsung was able to gain an 88% share of the U.S. 3D TV market. Starbucks via Ready Brew launched nationwide and took this year's seventh spot with an aggressive social media campaign, national via taste challenge days, and compelling coffee deals. Starbucks reported 100 million in global sales. Coming in at number six, the new touchscreen iPod Nano. Introduced in September 2010, it was described by Steve Jobs as the biggest change in the iPod lineup ever. McDonald's added to its successful McCafe line this year with real fruit smoothies, which placed fifth in our survey. Launched in July 2010, these smoothies helped McDonald's record its highest same-store sales gains in a year. Claiming the number four spot is the Motorola Droid. Motorola focused on toppling the Apple smartphone monopoly. A hundred million advertising budget helped Motorola sell over 1 million phones in the first 74 days after launch. Consumers who love salty sweet combinations will be pleased to see pretzel M&Ms at the number three spot on our countdown. Launched in April 2010, these pretzel filled M&Ms shook up the candy world with an extensive advertising campaign. The launch event featured performances from top American Idol stars. Mars called this one of its biggest launches for M&Ms in a decade. For the runner-up in this year's most memorable new product launch survey, Windows 7. Microsoft turned to consumers asking them what they wanted out of their operating systems. I'm a PC. I'm a PC. And Windows. And Windows 7. My idea. My idea. My idea. The launch of a new product was also driven by Windows brand lovers who held small pre-launch parties in their homes. Microsoft's personable marketing campaign helped Windows 7 surpass Vista's opening sales by 234% and made a positive impression with consumers. And finally, the number one spot goes to the Apple iPad. Described as revolutionary and magical by Steve Jobs, TV commercials highlighted everything from music to news, books, games, and even stargazing to showcase the versatility of this gadget. With over 3 million iPads sold in the first 80 days, Jobs made the iPad perhaps the most memorable Apple launch ever, solidifying the iPad spot as the most memorable new product launch of 2010. 
So congratulations to Apple for once again beating out Microsoft in the most memorable new product launch of 2010. The 2010 most memorable new product launch top 10 countdown is brought to you by Schneider Associates, Symphony IRI, and Sentient Decision Science. For more information, please visit us online at mmmpl.com. Well, no surprising really when you think about last year and new product launches that the iPad was the number one new product launch in 2010. Quite interesting that the Windows 7 product is right behind it, the classic Microsoft, ex-client of mine actually, Microsoft battle and um, Apple battle for dominance and sort of new products in the technology area. It'll be interesting to see after Microsoft's purchase yesterday of Skype for $8.5 billion if that changes in the battle forward. What I'd like to do now is introduce Timothy Lee, who is the Director of Marketing and Innovations for Effective Life, Effective Life Sciences. Effexa is uh, basically their core product is known as Cold FX, the number one cold and flu selling product in Canada. Prior to joining Effexa in 2009, Tim had an 11-year career with GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And prior to that, he'd spent about five to six years in the classic packaged goods industry, working for J.M. Schneider in Canada and General Mills Canada. With over 20-plus years in marketing experience, Tim has launched and been part of many new product introductions, and I'm sure all these have played a role in shaping his marketing innovation role at Effexa, making it even more innovative. So I'd like to welcome Tim to the show. Tim, welcome to Brand Advertising. Thank you very much for having me. What do you think of those top 10 products that were, came out in 2010? What stands out to you about them? Well, I, I did look at, through the list, and the thing that stood out at me was most of them were technology, and that's interesting. But half of them were still in the classic packaged foods, fast foods kind of industry. What I find interesting is that these lists exist. Um, right. There's multiple lists like this. There's the most innovative products. Um, I did a little bit of background digging, and uh, Fast Company has their top 50 innovative companies. MIT has published the top 50 worldwide companies. And it's a really exciting time because there is so much innovation around. Um, there's lots of company diving into it. It seems like innovation is the latest uh, panacea, the, the, the latest thing that people are into. What, what's, your, in your mind, the difference sort of between new product development and that of innovation, product innovation, product development, is it the same thing, or do you see any differences there? I, I think there are some differences. New product development is, in a way, um, well, why don't you put up that slide about innovator and inventor. Um, new product development is, in a way, like development, uh, innovating something, is taking it to the marketplace. Uh, one of the ways to think about this is the inventor creates the idea and sometimes requires a lot of cash to do it. Uh, the inventor, as you can see there, um, takes the idea, turns it into a real-world application, and actually makes money on it. Um, and to take that innovation into the real world, you have to take into account a lot more than just the idea. You actually have to take into account the consumer needs. And the consumer needs really are twofold. They have both the rational need for the product, and they also have an emotional need for aesthetic and design. And you have to appeal to both sides of that to be really effective. You know, there's this Interrand study that was just came out, I think, a few weeks ago. And funny enough, I think I participated online in the survey about six months ago or four months ago. So it's finally come out. And they pointed out the fact that less than 20% of marketers, and they, they interviewed CMOs, CEOs, etc., you know, do not um, willingly engage with their customers in evolving their brand. Is that shocking to you at all? It does. I saw your blog about that point, and that was really quite surprising because, um, frankly, you need to innovate with the consumer in mind. Um, looking at it, I, I looked up this one study by Boston Consulting Group, and they identified four key areas for innovation, what makes innovation a success. And the number one that they identified was idea generation linked directly to a deep understanding of your consumer. If you don't have that deep understanding of the consumer, you don't understand their needs. You don't know what they're really looking for um, and how to appeal to that. So in your background, and, and what's been some successes, and I think as you've pointed out before to me, you know, part of the game of success is you have to make a few mistakes along the way. Talk to yeah. us about 
you know, how you've learned from some of the product launches you've been part of that maybe didn't go as well? I think that it's important to uh, to learn from your mistakes, and there's been quite a few in the in the mix. Um, uh, there's been some. Uh, why don't you throw up the classic and the newcomers? Because I think there, there's a, an interesting collection of some winners. Uh, some of the winners include things that actually didn't require innovation at all. One of them is the uh, the, the Shreddy's Diamond, and that was really just a marketing exactly uh, turned on its side. Swiffer, uh, that was a new application. Rolo, a blending of two ideas. Uh, the new twist, I don't even know what cheese string is made of. It's terrifying. <laughs> but the fact that they turned this into a twisty product is very cool. And, and the last item that I showed there is, is frankly, one that's on the horizon, and we're probably going to hear a lot more of it, and that's LED lights. Um, the incandescent bulb is on its way out. We're going to be seeing more and more of this innovation coming through. Um, and all of those are great successes. And I bet you for every one of those successes, everyone who launched those successes has had one or two failures. And it's from those failures that you learn. Um, I've had my own share. <laughs> <laughs> what, give us an example. You'll have to tell us the name. But give us an example of, you'll have to tell us, the, again, the name. But why a product that you introduced didn't work? W was it misread from the research? Or is the research right, but it just didn't, you didn't interpret it properly? Or uh, because the company needed to not spend as much money to develop it? Or what sort of leads to some of the failures, do you think? Well, it's uh, it, every success and every failure has its own recipe. Right. It's a little different in every case. It's hard to just uh, pick one. Um, but I think that uh, there's, uh, I think one of the ways to think about this is that every company is a little bit different and every product is a little bit different. Um, in some companies, they talk about blue sky or blue ocean. And in some companies, they talk about how long is a piece of string. Um, I think that uh, when you look at it, um, it's it's unique. I, I can't really I can't really explain it unless I get into a lot of detail that I don't know that we want to. Sure. So what what ideally then are the steps that you've gone through that maybe you work with at at Effexa now that you're there? What you've worked with when you were on GSK product innovation teams, etc. What's sort of the the basic fundamental purpose and premise that you start with? One of the challenges with innovation is that it involves change. Innovations, the, the foundation of innovation is bringing something new to the consumer, something exciting. In that same way, change is possibly scary for the organization. And one of the ways to deal with that is, is stretching just one step at a time. If you think along the continuum, there's many ways to go outside of, the, of your current portfolio of products. One of the ways could be to look at different formats. Another way could be to look at different packaging. Another way could be look at different active ingredients and different indications. Um, if you take all of that all at the same time, it's too much to handle. But if you take each one individually, one step at a time, it's actually a little bit easier. And then over time, the opportunity would be to cross-pollinate, take the learning from one and cross-pollinate it from the learning from the other. Uh, one example that I pulled out is something that's actually happening in the U.S. right now. It's actually going on right now. Um, an example is the, um, the sweetener, the artificial sweetener category. In the U.S., um, there's three leading brands that's starting to be taken over by a fourth leading active ingredient, the Stevia brand. Um, and Equal is about to embark on a really radical strategy. The traditional model of the sweetener market, the, it has been one active ingredient, one brand name, one color. So for an example, the yellow packet is Splenda, and their active ingredient is sucralose. Pink, sweet and low with saccharin. Blue, equal, aspartame. Equal is now changing that game. They're actually in the midst of changing it this year. They've, they unfortunately are in the third place. They have nothing left to lose. They've been losing share like crazy. So they're now starting to take on everyone. They've decided the game is over. They're going to change the game. They are rebranding themselves. And instead of having one brand, one active ingredient, one color, they're keeping their brand name. They're going across all active ingredients. And they're going to create a rainbow of equal. So equal is now coming out with sucralose, saccharin, and aspartame in yellow, pink, and blue packets. In so fact, they're just going to own sweetening. They're, they're, we're, they're, we're just going to own sweetening of any kind. That's correct. That's correct. They're even going to come out with a green uh, for stevia, for the all-natural sweeteners. So they're repositioning themselves as the rainbow of sweeteners. It's a very bold attempt. I don't know how it's going to work. 
we can watch it unfold in the next year. So in your mind, is that a is that a product innovation or a packaging innovation or really is it a brand innovation? I think it's a combination of all of that because it's breaking a mold. Part of innovation is challenging the norm, uh, shooting the sacred cows, so to say, um, sh shaking things up. If a company doesn't have the opportunity or the funds to come up with a new active ingredient, you actually have to appeal to the consumer somehow. Um, and changing the, uh, the, the rules of the game is one of the ways to do that. Okay, let's, let's walk through then. So let's, let's assume we, 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 we feel we need a new product or an innovation. What's the first step that uh, a marketer or an organization should take? There's a feeling around the table. We're a little bit stagnant. Our brand is suffering. We've, we've had a product forever. Um, our competitors are jumping over us. What's the first step that one takes to decide we need to innovate, we need to have some new products into our pipeline? One of the first things I think you need to do is understand the consumer. Go right back to the consumer. Um, if you pull up that slide about connecting with our consumer. Is I think there a number, key, Tim? What slide uh, number is it? 21. Okay. If, uh, if you have a look at that one, uh, the world is different today than it ever was. Um, consumers are more fragmented. Their needs are more personalized. And everyone has a story from teens to over 50 to the working dad to the working mom. Um, you need to understand what they're looking for. You need to understand um, what's going on in their lives, their heads. And if you connect to that need at a very deep emotional level, you can actually develop your products to meet those needs. Sometimes it's about how you package them in a way that meets their environment. It might be changing up your uh, relationship with them, how you market to them, how you speak to them, um, and then understanding what it what they're looking for out of your product. Um, that's the key to innovation, is now, start with a consumer. Now, in the companies you've worked at in the past, was innovation, I mean, it affects a, you have a dedicated role to innovation. At other companies that you've been around, has innovation been the, re the responsibility of the marketing department group itself? And, and if you were the marketing director or brand director, that was just part of what you did, and you maybe worked with the research group or whatever. Uh, how has that role evolved itself? Like who's, who's responsible for driving the whole innovation discussion? Again, I think that's one of those uh, every company is different kind of an answer. Um, but I think if you w come up with that, uh, that recipe slide that I've got, um, there is something that is common to, to every situation in the sense that um, it is a lot more complex to come up with a new product innovation than just one person or one department leading something. Um, the recipe, I, I qualify it as it's one part inspiration or a good idea, uh, 10 parts perspiration or just getting it through the organization and getting people to buy into it. And then 100 parts collaboration. It is pure muscle and sweat. There's a process of working through how to take an idea from new idea to a new product. Uh, that conversion can be anywhere from six months to 18 months, depending on the nature of the idea. One of the projects you and I worked with, uh, worked on, it took about a year for it to come about, where our initial research into understanding the consumer took us all the way down the path of redesigning the packaging, the artwork, the communication, speaking about everything that the consumer is going to see and experience about the brand and then bringing it to life. And I'm really looking forward to having that show up in the marketplace. Fantastic. Now, once there's been a decision then, and, and there's been, it's coming either from an innovation department or it's, it's come from within the marketing group itself, you've, you've gone and talked to the consumers. What type of research, as you mentioned before, to talk to the consumers, what type of research do you go through to, to get to the end. I mean, I'm sure there's a blend of qualitative and quantitative and, and, and now factor in there the whole role the social media may play to getting consumer inputs into what are some of the products that they might like to see for, in general and, and maybe that fit with the, the company personality and brand. What research methods make sense to, or that you've potentially used or ha not potentially have used? All of the above. <laughs> Everything. Um, I call it the dragnet approach. Um, really, you want everything. And uh, there's, a, there's a great TV show from the 50s. I'm dating myself now. <laughs> it was called Dragnet. And the line from that, uh, that uh, police detective was, uh, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. When it comes right down to it, good marketing is facts-based information. It's, it's launched against known facts, known research. Uh, we know what the numbers are. We know what the prevalence of the situation is. We know 
uh, how many people suffer, how frequently they suffer. We know how, how frequently they go shopping for it. We know the price points that they're looking for. Uh, we understand uh, how many times they suffer. We understand what are the key shortfalls of their current uh, products that they're currently using. Um, we also ask what they would look for if they could design something for themselves. Um, all of that, I mean, there's, uh, there's research tools like AC Nielsen to understand the competitive marketplace, IMS, Euromonitor, Omnibuses. Um, there's lots of syndicated research that you can buy. There's also custom research that you can uh, design for yourself, focus groups. Um, there are Radian 6 uh, programs that you can study, uh, social media. Now there's a whole new way of actually tapping into Facebook uh, followers who actually voluntarily uh, participate in online research. Uh, we've created our own effects a consumer panel internally to tap into those consumers who feel a, a strong affinity to us and want to talk to us. And we want to actually listen to them and their opinions. So we, we do all sorts of research to get a little bit deeper, a little bit more insight, because it's that little bit of extra insight that actually wins at the end of the day. If you understand that little bit more about what that person's looking for, you really you really come up with some piece of magic sometimes. Now, with that consumer panel, are you at effects? Are you guiding them with potential product questions, or are they coming to you and say, "We'd like to"? Are they being specific, and then do you work with them, or is it just there? It's sort of a general conversation you're having, and now and then, product ideas and innovation is popping up. The way we're using it right now, um, it's a standardized quant research where we broadcast an email, they respond back by by checkboxing. Uh, certain responses or giving open-ended responses. Um, there are some opportunities that we have available via social media where we have followers of cold effects who just throw us ideas um, and they, they talk to us openly and, and we really appreciate that. We have people who call us on 1-800 numbers and give us ideas and we, we certainly appreciate all of that. So we listen, we take it all in and then uh, depending on the, the project and the, the, the situation, sometimes we dialogue and sometimes we just ask people to fill up forms. Tim, we have a question from someone in the web world, and Evan's going to pose it to you, so have a listen. Would, would you, Tim, ever consider launching a product using only social media? Um, there's, I guess there's two levels to answer that question. Um, only using social media for research or only using social media as a launch activation or a, a consumer launch. Um, and I guess the short answer is it's possible. It really depends on the product. Um, social media is ever evolving. It would be the equivalent of asking someone, uh, would you ever consider launching someone something with only billboard? And the short answer is yes, if it fits. Absolutely. That's an interesting question because I know, uh, effects so you guys have been pretty non-traditional in your approach going to marketplace with products and, and haven't relied uh, 100% like some of the, the major manufacturers out there on traditional media. You've, you've kind of been pretty... Uh, exploratory in the use of web and social media, haven't you? We have been incredibly dynamic. We have an amazing team of people here in the Toronto office that break all boundaries. It is awesome to watch them work. Um, they push the boundaries on, on how we go to market, how we activate, how we talk to consumers. We have some aggressive programs in social media. We do things that, frankly, uh, other companies, I think, only wish they could do. Um, we have an amazing digital team. We have an amazing uh, healthcare practitioner team. Um, our, our media team, um, they buy things that I can't... I, if you doubled our budget, I don't know that we could get it. It's just amazing the relationships that we have. So, and Tim, and sort of looking to wrap up here, what would be the, the one... For maybe the first three steps you would give it to someone watching the show that's been thinking about, you know... Our product's a little bit stale, our product line's a bit stale, um, maybe even the brand's a bit stale, and we need to innovate. And I really wouldn't, I need to figure out what are the first maybe three steps I should be doing to bring some innovation into the organization. What advice would you give them? I'd say three things. First is stay open-minded. You don't have all the answers, and if you don't listen to the consumer, you're not going to get the answer. Um, the second is recognize it's a journey and a process. Um, it's a long journey. It requires a lot of people. It requires a lot of energy, a lot of buy-in. And the third is keep your eyes on the prize. And the way to think about this one is we're into springtime right now. Um, I see a lot of motorcyclists on the road, and they're great. They're enjoying the open air and, and, and getting out there. 
thing I find interesting is that you can always tell where a motorcyclist is going to go because he turns his head. He turns his helmet, and as a driver, you can see where he's looking is eventually where he's going to go. That's the same thing with every organization. If they look towards the next innovation, if they look towards the consumer, they will get it because that's where their eyes are going. So keep your eyes on the prize. Excellent, excellent advice. That's quite a nice graphic to end with, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. It's been, uh, I think, enlightening, enlightening to hear sort of your background on product innovation. Product innovation drives the marketing world. Everyone's fighting for it. And just look at the battle that the technology world's happening. As you pointed out, a lot of those top 10 product innovations last year were technology-oriented. And I appreciate you being on Brand Advertising. And uh, we'll talk soon. Uh, so once again, Tim, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. What I'd like to do now is show a, uh, a case study that was uh, on that website that I've mentioned before called Ads of the World. And this was for a South African telco that were launching uh, an innovative new product. They were sort of four or fifth, I remember fourth or fifth player in the market. And they were getting into the telecommunication game. And they had to, wanted to innovate a brand new product that would resonate with a unique target group. And this case study is outstanding work um, of how much effort needs to go into it. As Tim was talking about it, it takes a lot of time, a lot of people, and you have to really keep your eye on the prize. They kept it very simple. They created a brand name. They created a brand icon, iconography around it. They used social media, traditional media, celebrities, you name it, they used it. It's a fantastic case. And on the back of that video, we'll come back to brand advertising and end the show.
morning show. Rashad has said, hi, John, can you take a couple of calls on the new Hater ad campaign? It's fast becoming South Africa's favorite greeting. Hater. 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 That's a big hater. <laughs> <laughs> Eastern Cape producer. It's, it's kind of a new buzzword. Is it 8 o'clock? It's <laughs> the news at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. It's better than I yoga. Challenge everyone is going to call in on the open line to greet me by Pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? Fantastic example of how you can be not the first player in the category, but if you use insights, listen to the consumer, have the dedication and the willingness to break some boundaries, you can do amazing things. And I think that hate of work uh, that McCann Erickson's done in South Africa is, is, is a great example. So in summarizing today's show, I hope the viewer and the listener understands the role product innovation plays and how it literally is the lifeblood of an organization. Look at what product innovation did for someone like Apple. They were pretty much almost out of the game. And now they are a world leader. One of the top, I think in many categories, are ranked as the top brand for brand recognition, overtaking players like Coca-Cola, etc. So product innovation is critical. If you don't feel you have innovative products or thinking coming into your organization, the first step is really, as Tim mentioned as well, is listen to the consumer. Go to your consumer, talk to them, express to them that your desire to understand what they think is important in terms of new products, new services, new tools that they can use. And again, social media, as one of the um, listeners sent in, is, is a great way to do this today. But as well, there's other areas, whether it's, it's qualitative groups or quantitative groups that you want to bring into play. Talk to your, your uh, consumers, engage with them, engage with your staff, engage internally, allow everybody to break down the borders. So you yourself as a, as a driver in the company need to be very open-minded, have some vision and recognize are the products you have today going to be relevant in two months, three months, six years? Because if you're not relevant, your brand's not relevant, and if you're not relevant to your customers, they will not buy you. You just won't matter. And one of the ways to matter is continually be bringing new products or product innovations onto existing products into play. So with that being said, thank you very much for watching this edition of Brandvertising right here on Fuse Logic TV, and we'll see you next time.